Walk with me through the cellar door. The storm is coming, Francis. A portal to a more skeptical world. Cellar Door of Skeptics begins right now. Prepare for the revolution with your hosts, Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna. Are the primaries undemocratic? Is PETA killing animals? Want to discuss child abuse? <laughs> Welcome back to another oh, episode man. of Cellar Door Ske- Skeptics. Thank you so much for sticking with us and uh, tuning in for another episode. We do this weekly, and, and we enjoy what we do, and we love the fact that there's some of you out there listening. Make sure if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to have a conversation with us, message us at cellardoorskeptics at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook or tweet at us. Though, as Zach Religge discovered, I am not the best tweeter out there. Yeah, we're both pretty lazy. We have an awesome episode planned for you tonight. We have a, a discussion that Hannah and I are going to have in a minute about primary primaries and how undemocratic they are. Or maybe they're democratic. We don't know, but we're going to have that conversation. We're going to talk about if PETA is killing animals, and then we're going to end the episode honoring National Child Abuse Prevention Month by talking with author of 1324, a look into the lives of children that have been abused. And and, and it's a, a very touching subject. You want to make sure you stick through the whole episode because I reveal some personal things within there. But before we get to that point, before we get there, we got to talk about the primaries. We got to talk about whether they're democratic, undemocratic, or what the fuck anything means. But we can't do that. We can't do any of that unless we bring my famous, my awesome, my imperialistic co-host on, <laughs> Mr. Chris Hanna. Welcome to the show tonight, sir. Well, since I'm imperialistic, I'm going to take over your your time spot here, and we're going to talk about Democratic primaries and Republican primaries and how they might be okay if they're insane and terrible like they seem to have been lately. Well, you do get to take know. over, Chris. I mean, I mean, if you think about it, you did pick the <laughs> topics for this episode. You picked all the topics on this episode except for uh, the the author one. And, and so it's kind of refreshing. You know, usually I'm the one that kind of dictates and this and that. And so it's nice that we have a new dictator in charge of Solidar Skeptics tonight. Well, at least I didn't take over power violently. So it's been kind <laughs> of a nice concession of power. <laughs> that is true. That is true. So well, this this concept is is surprisingly unnerving to me lately. Like what we've been seeing and what we've been dealing with as far as the, the primaries in this country, I, I don't know if it's because I'm paying much much closer attention this time around. Yeah, I paid attention during man. the last yeah, well the last couple of um, presidential elections and things that I, I paid attention to the primaries. I voted in, but. They they weren't this really really micro um, microscopic analyzed situation. So uh, we've been seeing what people have been calling voter fraud. We've been seeing weird turnouts, high and low. We've been seeing the differences between the the primaries being open, being closed, and the caucuses. And there's all kinds of people who are new to the game, and they're screaming about how this seems like we're getting cheated. This seems unfair. Why is this so complicated, and why is it so so different everywhere? And so what I think the biggest thing to start off with is, like, we're seeing low turnouts in really, really big states. The one that happened most recently in New York, we have a, a nice article from thenation.com, and I... I, do, I was genuinely flabbergasted. I was really surprised that New York had the second lowest voter turnout so far this entire election season. Only be, The only state they beat was Louisiana. I mean, just think about the population difference between those two states. And so what the hell's going on is really the question we have to ask. And so what do you think, man? Do you think people are just disenfranchised? They're just like, this is stupid. I'm not going to be a part of it or what? I think there's a couple of different reasons that we could look at. You know, you have... People are disenfranchised. I mean, we, we talked about this before. You know, one of the, the people I enjoy listening to is Dan Carlin. And if anybody hasn't ever heard of Dan Carlin, you should go out, Google his podcast, and um, you'll love it. It's, it's called Common Sense with Dan Carlin. He also has a Hardcore Histories podcast. 
big fan of that too, but it's not political. But the political one is re- really, really good. And he actually talks about this before. He talks about disenfranchised people. He talks about people that want something different than the status quo. And he also talks a lot about how the fact that technically Democratic and Republican parties are not the political majorities. They're not the ones that are told by the Constitution they can run America, but they have been running America. So I think you have, a, you have a lot. You have a combination of everything, right? You have a combination of disenfranchised people. You have a combination of people that are going to go vote so they have no reason to vote in the primaries. You know, like, I know I want Bernie Sanders. I have a reason why I want to go out and vote Bernie Sanders, you know, personally. But there's a lot of people that might say, hey, I know that this delegate or this delegate is going to win. And so, therefore, I'm not going to go out and I'm not going to vote in the primaries. There's lots of people who feel that way. You know, unfortunately, New York is very um, Clinton-esque. You know, they, they, it goes to the Clintons. And, and whether that's good or bad or indifferent doesn't matter. What matters is, is that Clinton does kind of have a hold on, you know, New York. And that's fine. It, people can vote the way they want. And, and the big thing, though, is is if they're voting for Clinton, if they feel that the numbers show, and the numbers do show, no matter what anybody wants to tell you, the numbers do show Clinton is in the lead, that the probability for her winning this and, and being nominated is very high, you know, what's the reason to go out and vote in the primaries? Because in the end, if the superdelegates are going to vote for her, who cares? And then you have people on the other side of the fence that are going out to vote because they say, I can change something. I want to change something, and and without those people, we wouldn't ever have, ever have heard about Bernie Sanders. Yeah, definitely. There's there's the big thing is that Clinton has always been the inevitable. She is the the heavyweight in the room. There's very low chance of her being toppled as this King Kong juggernaut. But the thing that people who have been more interested in the independent esque line that Bernie Sanders and even on the, on the Donald Trump side is that they're just tired of that status quo. And so they're getting involved and all of a sudden they're getting slapped around by a bunch of really weird things that they just did not expect because they've only voted in either the generals or they just never voted at all. So in Kings County Board of Elections, they purged 126,000 registered democrats from voting po- roles in brooklyn and so we're, we're seeing these in arizona we had problems with reduction in total number of polling stations so that in certain minority based areas there was only one for you know thousands and thousands and thousands of people so we had four or five six hour waiting times so people can't do that they can't make an entire day to go vote even though they're legally supposed to be able to it, it becomes this really big headache and so you're disenfranchising people or you're just blocking them from voting yeah so people are saying it's it's un- Unfair. They're cheating. Well, I and I agree with that to a point. I, okay, I don't agree with the statement of that they're cheating. Right? I don't. I don't want to get to that yeah. because that's a conspiracy. And unless you have <laughs> fact out proof, you and I are not going to agree. We're just not. But the big thing though is is that I do agree that I think everybody should be registered to vote. You turn eighteen, you're registered to vote. It's not a question. You're automatically registered. I don't understand why people have to register to vote. And and I guess the people that want to say, hey, you know, I shouldn't have to register to vote, and you know, it's I want to be independent of the government. Well, then go do it. Go unregister. I think that the new there should be a new law that basically says, hey, you're registered to vote. You don't want to be come 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 sign a document that says I don't want to be registered to vote. Make those people be the ones. I, I think there's more apathetic voters out there than they are uh, the people that are saying I'm not going to vote and I don't want to be on a voting regimen. Because to me, to me, if we created more fair laws in terms of how we how the delegates or how the the candidates get to address people and how people get to canvas and how people get to uh, you know spam on social media, I think if we restricted some of those things a little bit more than we have, but we registered everybody to vote, you would see a lot better turnout. And you know, our friends over at Paleo Radio mentioned this before, and I disagree with them a little bit on this. But they talked a lot about uh, a couple months ago. You know, basically people for Bernie randomly messaging them. You know, there was a huge social media campaign. Well, there's no laws to tell them they can't do it. So you might find it in distaste, Jeremiah. But at some point, there is no law saying you can't do this, you can't do that. And so I'm saying is why not redefine how people are addressed, how people are gathered, how we talk to them, how we have conversations with them. Because if we change that, 
it would change the social media aspect. People wouldn't need to go, oh, you need to go vote. You need to go do this because you're automatically registered to vote. And then if we turn around and we said, okay, every time there is some sort of a vote, it wasn't controlled by that party, but it was controlled by the majority, by some sort of um, national electorate. Like the national electorate says, okay, here is a set day. We're going to allot this many polling places based on the number of people. We can use statistics, and everything's good. If we all- allocated it to the federal norm, we wouldn't have some of these problems like you're talking about, correct? Yeah, and that's that's basically the argument that a lot of people are making that are just you know average Joes who are who are now interested in this year's uh, presidential election. So the question is. Is it okay what's been happening? Is it okay that weird switches have been happening? Is it okay that things have been inconsistent and they're not exactly the same everywhere? So there's there's places where people are making mistakes. There's the woman who who removed all of those 126,000 Democrats. She has been suspended from her position. The the number of people in New York only only 19.7 percent of eligible voters cast a ballot. So there's a huge disenfranchise or just apathy towards the electoral um just for okay. the primaries though that's well, the thing on. here this hold, is just the primary too far though let's let's stop before we go way too far into this is it illegal any of the things that they're doing what is the law no, and that's what we're going to talk about that's what we're going to talk about in a second is all, all of these things are what's pissing people off and so now i want to move into so the, People are saying the primaries aren't fair. They're not democratic. Well, the question is, are they supposed to be? And there's a great article from Slate. And what he's basically, what the author says, his name is William Sailton. He says that they're not supposed to be because the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are independent of the government in that they're separate entities and they're they're political parties. And so they they're allowed to by their their the definition of their group decide who's going to be their leader. They decide they are allowed to decide the rules. They're allowed to decide these things. And so it's not this it's not a uniform thing across the country. It's allowed to be different and allowed to be quirky. And in the end, a lot of people have been saying this that even if Donald Trump does get picked as a Republican nominee for all of the people's votes, it's still possible that the Republican Party could say, no, we're just going to have Paul Ryan run for presidency. Okay, but hold on. Like that, that's What's, a possibility. If, if it's their party and they're not elected by the federal government, if that's their business, what's wrong with that? that it's well, their party, correct? Yeah, it's it's just like it'd be like if you you imagine the Republican and, uh, and the Democrat Party as a as a business, and they're choosing their CEO, but that you have all of the people in the company vote for all the you know these are the best leaders, these are the best leaders, and this one gets picked. Well, let's say there was some mishappenings and some stuff that wasn't one hundred percent fair. The government doesn't have to come in and say, oh well, this needs to be fixed, and oh that wasn't properly democratic. And so that let's say the Hillary Clinton of that company wins, and but there was a ton of people who got out and actually participated in this thing for the corporate CEO, and uh, they're upset because things didn't go you know their way, obviously. But they're also upset that it didn't seem like it was completely unbiased and scientific and whatever. That's the way this guy from Slate is saying that we should kind of treat the Republican and Democratic primaries that there are their own things and these inconsistencies and stuff. It's the the government isn't. Specifically, supposed to control, corral, and hold them make to you know a fair democratic process for the primaries. Once it's the general elections, and those are the representatives, and they're act- one of those people gets picked for president, then you know all these the the voting rights acts and stuff really really come into play. But I think before you get into that, we have to look at what do other countries do, Chris? I mean, is there other countries that have political parties that over Trump this? And, and and we're treading on some some water here that I could tell you libertarians would be against. What you're talking yep. about is is creating some sort of a federal structure that allows for certain types of voting, and you're over trumping the what you would call corporate organizations of the De- Democratic and Republican Party. You're over trumping these, and and I think a lot of libertarians would have a hard time with that, and so. I would ask you, in reality, if we let's look at what the rest of the world does. You know, we can get rid of some of the third world countries that have very religious politics that over dominate things. But with the rest of the world, how does it allow its governments to be elected? Is it through these political parties, or is it through a federal mandated open nominational uh, sect? I guess if you want to call it that. 
Well, from what I know, the parliamentary system, you can you can get a small, um, I guess, a small highlight in uh, in England, and or it's especially in England. But in Canada, there's different European uh, primary election systems, and and as, as you would expect, there's tons of different ones, and uh, they all have parties. And but one of the things that we see is there's a lot of variety. You'll hear about the Pirate Party, the Tories, and and a lot of these other groups. There's there's just a ton of different primaries, um, specifically. But the, their exact processes and things like that, I, I I don't have any very specific information because I obviously didn't research for other <laughs> countries, but. My my guess is is that they're. I mean, if you're going to be picking your your representatives, like there's going to be either it's all every party just gets to pick one and everybody votes, or you have to do a uh, a primary system where inside the party you somehow have to check it. I'm gonna I I would have to get back to you as far as what other countries do, and then but what we can talk about specifically and what what um what we have here basically is um we've got a person like. Bernie Sanders, who wins closed caucuses and closed primaries better than open primaries, except for Michigan, where that was a bit of an outside. But uh, he he obviously does much better in caucuses. Now, the reason is the differences between uh, a, a normal primary, like open or closed, and a caucus. Now, you said that you really don't have too much information, like as to what the difference is. And, um, no, I'll, we I'll be honest. Kind of I, I'm, I'm not. I, I never knew. I guess I never got involved in politics enough to know what the difference between a caucus and a primary was. It, w- it was nothing that ever came, I guess, about because you know when I had issues after Bush, you know, with Kerry, I, I was not voting Democrat. I voted Green Party all the way. It wasn't even yeah. a question. I, I had no interest <laughs> in Kerry. And then when Obama came along, that was a pretty for me. That was a pretty easy go around. And then the second time, you know, after he, you know, started doing things against what I believed in, it was still a pretty easy go around given that I was not going to vote for a Mormon. And the third party <laughs> candidates I'd voted for before never really took off. It was never a thing for, you know, what I wanted because they never fit into the system. And that's, we had this conversation, I don't know, about a month, month and a half ago, Chris, we talked about this. What happens when you want to vote against the normal party, are you willing to give up a a, a couple of terms worth of Republican ruling to split the party? And is it worth it? And and we talked about this, and we talked about how Dan Carlin, you know, said the same thing. He he said basically what happens when people want to vote for Trump now, and then all of a sudden Trump doesn't get in, and the Republican Party splits. What happens? If Trump doesn't get elected, do we get more of a irrational, larger, crazier person than Trump? Will we get on the same side? Will we get more of a, a higher Marxist than you know where Bernie falls into? I mean, technically, I'm more socialist than Bernie is. I'm a lot more fucking socialist than Bernie is. And, and we're not having that conversation. And, and you're right. What's the difference between caucuses and primaries that could affect it? And should we really regulate it? Yeah, that that is the big question. And so what I wanted to do is kind of transition a little bit back and forth here. So what we have is we have people like Sanders who are doing very well in caucuses and people like Hillary Clinton who do quite well in the primaries. Now, the big difference in a lot of the primaries and stuff, those are more like the general election. You're going to go and you're going to vote. A closed, a closed primary, obviously, you have to be affiliated with a party. And then you can go vote for that party. If you're not affiliated with any particular party, specifically Republican or Democrat, because usually the other parties don't really have primaries because they they only have one candidate and it's not a big push or anything. So you're going to have a closed primary. So you have to be registered as Republican or Democrat. And that was the big hoopla in New York is that people who were registered as Democrat disappeared from the system or their their. Um, affiliations were changed and so there was just problems and they they were upset about that and that's one of the reasons why they say that there's a low turnout in new york but uh with an open primary like what's what michigan had when you get to the front 
gate to vote, you just say the the woman at the or the person at the the table will say, "Well, are you going to vote Republican or Democrat or anything else, really?" And you say which one you want, and they'll give you that card, and that has all of the people on it. You select one, but you can vote for anybody. I know people who are Republican who I convinced to help vote for Bernie Sanders in, in an effort to try to stop Hillary Clinton from getting in because they don't like her policy, and they figured that they would be have a more effective vote and voice voting that way. Well, that is the open primary. It's it's you're still um, anonymous that you, people don't know who you voted for unless you tell. The caucus is like going into a giant or sometimes it's giant, but most of the time it's like the Iowa caucus is you go into like gymnasiums, you go into small spaces and you stand up and you like walk with the people that are, you're going to support that you, that support your, your candidate, like you shoulder to shoulder and you like, okay, me and you, we are all here. And then those people over there, those are the ones who are supporting the other candidate. Mm-hmm. And then you, you listen to speeches from the, de- the people who the, could be the representatives the, the like the delegate for that precinct to go up and give a speech and say, and the people will try to convince them to change or, her, change them to change his or her um, who they're going to vote for and all of that it's very included it takes hours and hours and hours sometimes and so this is like the, are you going to go to a caucus are you going to be involved in this you know whole day process and that changes I mean the way and what and there's no anonymity like you're in front of your neighbors and they see who you're voting for so th- there's a big difference between that and the people that are really dedicated are the ones that are going to the caucuses and Bernie has this really 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 dedicated but smaller base than Hillary which I believe is one of the reasons why he wins caucuses. And you know, it's funny because uh, there's a little show called House of Cards on Netflix, you know, with Kevin Spacey. Little show. Little show. Little show. Oh, love the show. Love Kevin Spacey, though. i big Kevin Spacey fan. But in, yeah. in it, anyway, they, they actually do this. They hold different caucuses, you know, for yeah. the vice president. And it's actually, if, you, if anybody's not seen the show, go out and watch it right now before the whole primaries and, and, and elections happen because... It's very relevant to what's happening now. I actually have been kind of putting off on it because I kind of want to try to watch it during the general election, like to like finish the last episode <laughs> of this. Because I'm assuming that there's the the, the the last episode is who wins. Yeah. The uh, well, I won't the tell. election. We, we won't so, have that conversation. Yeah, don't, don't, but they, don't. You're, they do you're that bad with the spoilers. vice president, though. Hannah. <laughs> they do the caucus okay. thing with the vice president, and and in the yeah. end, they, um, spoiler alert here. They're turning the vice president ship over from this individual to basically the president or the impromptu president's wife, and it's just it, it's but it's all this elaborate scheme behind the scenes. So even mm-hmm. even Hannah, even even to your point, yeah, Bernie wins and does better in the caucuses. But if what House of Cards says is true in the conspiracy theory, a lot of this shit is still directed <laughs> behind the scenes. So it doesn't matter whether it's a caucus or a primary. All these things are bullshit elections. And it to me, to me, the direction we should be moving with this, and I don't want to waste too minute, too much time on this, but the direction we should be moving is to a nationalized platform of voting, to that we take out some of this purchasing, if you want to call it, of people's votes and pandering to people. We want to move into the point where if you have a good argument and people fall for it and they vote for you, you should get it. And, and I, I think if we abolish a party system and we move to a, well, I don't care what he is. The only reason we have a party system is because we want to know, hey, Ted Cruz, oh, Republican Party, we know we're not going to vote for you whether we want to or not. And, and, you know, it's kind of true. You know, Jeremiah challenged me this time once. He goes, he goes, how many Republicans have you ever voted for? You know how many I voted for, Chris? Zero. Zero, honestly. I've never voted for a Republican, <laughs> ever. Me I either. voted independent. I voted Green Party and I voted Democratic, but I've never, ever, ever once voted for Republican. Never. I just, I just can't do it. And you know, I think these labels hurt and help us. And I think the large parties see these as big benefits, right? You're Democratic. You're voting part of this populace. You're part of this community, right? We're, we're trying to change the world. You know, what was Obama's big, you know, speech, right? Hope, 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 hope through the yeah. community. Here I'll. How flatlined I've said that hope. Uh, yeah, there is hope. You he definitely. To, okay, he, he, you have. He to did. He, he 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 was a good president he, for the most part until he started fucking yeah. sending drones and shit out. <laughs> he he was a very good centrist president who flipped to both sides of the 
the political spectrum as if there's only two directions anyone can possibly be from liberal to, to conservative, which I've always disagreed with on that. But regardless, he was a, he was a he was a good president for getting some things done, a bad president for getting other things that nobody wanted or nobody that voted for him really wanted to get done. And so, but the bigger question, I agree with you that. You know, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, Green Party, everybody. I like the idea of just open primaries across the board. Let the people really have the biggest say. And it's easy to vote. It's There's no hassle. And then the other question is, it's like, well, if these political parties continue to exist, how much of the government saying this is how you have to do it? What's the point of having the political parties? Because essentially what happens now is like the corporate analogy that I gave a little while ago. It's... Okay, if we open up to everything and this co- the corporation's president now that has been chosen is done by all the people and it's um it's not really representative of the of the corporation it's just this this snapshot in time of the way in which the the employees think for right now that is that really representative of what the democratic party is of that what the republican party is and so that that little bit of freedom to this is my group this is our group and this is the kind of person we want leading our group that's what basically the guy from slate is saying is that Bernie Sanders has never identified as a liberal or as a uh, a Democrat until recently when he just made he had to make the commiseration. He had to compromise to say Democrat because that's the only way to get elected is either Democrat or Republican. Like if you're in the third party, you essentially become a a, a non candidate. And so I, I would. I would love to see, you know, the freedom that these Democrat and Republican parties have in being able to choose their candidate like they do now, maybe not being quite so sketchy about how they vote, but they would still have the freedom to kind of, this is our group and we're going to choose and we're going to choose in our own way. But I would just love that there were more instead of the fact that, no, if I want to run for president, I have to pick one of those two. There's no other way to win. And that's when this, you know, this problem that we're having with people outside trying to get in and they, they don't re- really represent what the Republicans or what the, the Democrats have to say that they represent. And so that's the, the argument and the problem here. And I would love for more. I would love for more um, parties, more than I would just to have just open primaries across the board, because the parties essentially become unimportant. Then it's like, what's the point? And I think as we wrap this segment up, I think that we we have to look at that. We have to look at what the delegates represent, what these other people represent, where we can go in the future with this, and it, and if we don't have, if we don't have the choice, where where are we? Well, we don't have to pick a final answer. Like this, it's okay if we choose something different and it doesn't work. Then we can go back to what we had. But at least try something instead of just kind of putting our feet in the sand and never changing ever. <laughs> if we don't have that, if we don't have, you know, the ability to choose, where are we? And so I think that's that's the big thing. Where does the evolution of our life go? Where do we where do we transition to? How do we move forward without moving backwards? And I think we've tried it one way. What's what's the harm in trying it another way? And I'll be honest. It, I'll be honest. In this election, I'll probably vote for Hillary if she gets the nomination. I probably will do that. Even if Bernie gets the independent nomination, which he says he's not going to run, but <laughs> politicians are liars. And yeah. even if he gets the independent, not I'll vote Hillary. And that's just the way it is. But I would like to see, you know, I would like to see the two corporations broken down, the corporations yeah. of the Republican, the Democratic Party. I would like to see them taken down, taken apart, dismantled, remantled in a smaller, lesser form. You want to use the antitrust laws that are designed to stop monopolies, but you want to do that for a political means, so political economy, saying that these two groups own the entire political economy, and that is un. Uh, democratic that's you know it's not very democrat not very uh conducive of a, of a true demo- a democracy or uh, a democratic republic like we have here and that's a really great way to put it yeah i think you just won the whole thing <laughs> i won the internet for the day <laughs> yeah. and, and so as as we wrap up and we close the segment out i think it's important that we work towards removing these two larger entities. And and it, it doesn't say anything about Hillary or it doesn't say anything about Bernie and it doesn't say anything about Chris or Chris. 
but it does say that what we want is to move to a more genuine, thought-provoked conversation to be had. And that I think Variety. that if we move that way, you'll see both the Democratic and the GOP party split, splinter, and become something completely new, where there's a little bit more options, more choice, and more ability to let people have the freedom that they want. Make sure you stick around for another segment of Seller Girl Skeptics, because when we come back, when we come back from this amazing break, we're going to be talking about PETA killing animals. And then make sure you stick around even farther, because we have an interview with author of 1324. We'll be right back with more Seller Door Skeptics. Hello, I'm Miss B. Haven. I'm Demanda Wright. And we're promoting, promoting secular, secular feminism. feminism. And you're listening to Seller Door Skeptics. What will a child do when there is no way out? Chris might have told you that his mother's boyfriend was strict, but he wasn't your run-of-the-mill evil stepfather. Gracious, Chris, what are you doing out so late? A shocking blitzkrieg of murder, conspiracy, and child abuse. Publishers Weekly. A grotesquely powerful tale that deserves to be read. Heresy in the Heartland. Who is Alan Garfield? Depending on who you believe, he is either a celebrated Christian minister or the leader of a child abuse cult. 1324 by M. Dolan Hickman. Available on Amazon.com. Like what you're hearing? Check out more Cellar Door Skeptics every week right here on Spreaker and iTunes. Make sure you come back and check out new episodes with your hosts, Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna. And always remember, prepare for the revolution. Hi, this is Sharon Bush, newest and most badass host of the Unbuckling the Bible Belt podcast, and you're listening to Cellar Door Skeptic. the show. Welcome back to Cellar Door Skeptics. Thank you so much for sticking around through that first segment. We're back now with Mr. Hannah as we're going to talk about PETA and if they are euthanizing animals and if they kill more animals than any other shelter. And we thought this would be an interesting topic because there's a little bit of hypocrisy here. If PETA, and I'm saying if, if PETA is euthanizing animals greater than their adoption rates, to me that almost seems a little bit hypo- hypocritical because their goal is, is to discourage people from killing animals, but yet they're killing animals themselves. And I'll remain skeptical. Hannah's provided like seven <laughs> fucking links that he wanted me to spend all Sunday reading through, which I didn't, by the way. But he wanted me to spend all Sunday reading through these links because he thinks that this is an important topic. And that there is this big conspiracy. So, Hannah, tell us a little bit about the conspiracy that you're buying into nowadays. Okay, well, the big thing is, like, I I was just flipping through Reddit, and I was like, someone posted on there. There's this link that PETA is, like, like euthanizing tons and tons of animals. And I was like, there's no way. PETA is like this no-kill, love-all-the-creatures type group i mean they go nuts when they see fur when they see anything that has to do with animal cruelty and the like the what is it the aca the ac something i what who does who does uh sarah mclaughlin sing for who is it oh she sings for the the national rescue society or yeah something like that. yeah you're right she does she doesn't sing for them. I, they use her on some of their okay, commercials well, it's the only place i know her from anymore so regardless wait you you don't know who, i know hold on, hold on. you don't know who sarah mclaughlin I, well is? i don't know any of her music and i have not seen or heard of it any of it since she started doing that commercial so i'm assuming that oh, her well, career you've is dead. never you've never heard her music before not Seriously? since the 90s when she was popular. Now she's just the commercial lady who sings when the puppies are sad. <laughs> she's not just a commercial lady. Oh. Anyways, okay. So, like, I, I, PETA, 
is euthanizing creatures. So I immediately followed through the link and I did some research and looking on YouTube and um, I found there's an episode of Penn and Teller's Bullshit where they call bullshit on PETA. And the big problem and the big situation here is the no-kill shelter. That's that's the whole thing that everybody's arguing about. Is the no-kill shelter the best option and the best thing for these creatures? So uh, I personally, I, I understand euthanasia and I'm comfortable with it. Mostly in cases where the animal is just going to be absolutely miserable or it's dying or it's really sick or whatever. So I guess that's my position. Where are you at? Are you kind of in the middle as I, like I am on that? I'm kind of in the middle. I'll be honest. I am very torn uh, between whether I should be eating meat or not. Meat tastes mm-hmm. good. And that's that's a horrible thing to say. <laughs> um, I understand the logic behind the vegetarianism. I, I understand it. I don't actually disagree with it. I have a really hard time saying I should eat meat, but yet understand the humanity and how things relate. And so personally on my side of the th- fence is I'm, I'm very torn. I would like to be a vegetarian. I would like to move towards that lifestyle. But I'm not 100% sold on the moralistic side of things, if you want to call it that. It's the empathic response that gets me. It's like, I'm fine with eating meat all day long when it is meat. Like, it's just food. But when I think about the animals, whether or not they have complex minds or kinds of minds, as Dennett would say, what what are they experiencing? And we know animals experience pain in varying degrees. They have positive and negative responses to different levels of pain. And so, like, when I think of it that way, I, I feel bad being a meat eater or an omnivore. But I also, like, it's so, it's so natural. It's, it's part of nature. It's just it's something that happens all the time. So, so yeah, it just it seems so natural that you know animals eat other animals, humans eat animals. It's just something that's been going on for millennia, and so it's a it's a it's an interesting case of cognitive dissonance that I can openly say I have the ability to deal with. I don't like the idea the, of killing something, but once it's dead, once that life is gone and it does not have the ability to feel pain anymore i am all about turning it into a, a roast or a flank steak or any kind of gloriously tasty meals so like i said in between i'm a meat eater but i do feel empathy for these creatures so what's the situation there's a no-kill shelter so have you have you ever been to no-kill shelters no, do you th- i've do never you personally been ever to okay the the, the no-kill shelter idea is basically that obviously very literal they do not kill at these shelters there's problems and positives from that what happens very the first thing that happens usually in an in a no-kill shelter right is it's filled it's full they get filled incredibly fast and animals pets and anything that we would feel empathy for like we don't care about rats and pigeons or whatever but um in most cases the the animals that we're talking about are family pets and livestock things that humans interact with pretty regularly once once the no-kill shelters are full we have to make more no-kill shelters or make no-kill shelters bigger and so PETA's response to that is the animals that are really sick the animals that are messed up because i have a one of the actual from their website, they talk about one PETA staff who managed a no-kill shelter had to change a part after seeing a pit bull who had lived in a cage for 12 years. He had gone mad from confinement and would spend the day slamming his body into the sides of his cage, becoming so enraged that the workers were afraid to handle him. After witnessing that miserable life, she realized that some fates truly are worse than death. So that's the PETA argument, that euthanasia for animals is okay when the situation calls for it and there's no perfect fine line that will ever give you a guarantee yes this is perfect or not but that seems like a pretty viable situation for euthanasia yeah yeah and the question is is why is that somewhat permissible is there a reason behind why they feel this is permissible versus the other group who says this is unpermissible well the other group just says that that we should never kill any animal like they should it should all be natural death they should no interaction no no murder no no destruction of life and so it's kind of like this like 
Buddhist ideology where all life is equal. Killing a dog is the same as killing a person. And since we don't have euthanasia legal for humans, you can't assist in suicide. The same kind of thing. Like the animals should be allowed to naturally die. And, so would their argument so, change if you could assist suicide? I mean, I mean, I, for, for, I doubt for, it. <laughs> okay, and fair enough. You know, for for me, when we look at it, we go. I, I'm very pro assisted suicide. You know, I'm I'm pro Me that too. that that fits in my my corner very well because I don't believe that we shouldn't allow individuals to make certain types of choices, especially when they're on their deathbed. And and, and these people go through a lot of um, questions and discussions and investigations. They don't just go, oh, you want to die? There you go. Here's a license. Go get some medicine that'll kill you. That doesn't happen. That's not the reality of it. And and some of me yeah. says, well, the reason the difference between us and animals is a is a consciousness aspect, right? Most animals are not conscious; they're not understanding ability the same way we are, and that that's how I can draw the line in between the fact that I do eat meat versus the part of me that wants to be a vegetarian. And I almost say, is why why are we worried about when we kill them or how we kill them as long as we can agree to the fact that. If it's not deserved, we shouldn't kill them. We shouldn't just slaughter things to slaughter things. We should slaughter things because it provides a nourishment to us. And we should slaughter things because if in society these things are going to be a huge drain and nobody's going to deal with them, at some point, what are we going to do with it? But it brings up a bigger question. If you took what we're doing to the animals at, at the PETA shelters, right? And there, you had an article that said they're euthanizing 88% in Virginia. If you took that statistic and looked at, what about the people? We have to look at what the difference is between an animal and a person and why it's justifiable to allow Peter to slaughter these animals versus if we took a bunch of orphans and slaughtered them. Well, yeah, or not even so much the orphans or whatever. It would be, you know, like just wandering aimless adults that are probably never going to find a family, probably never really going to be able to function in society normally. And so these are just, they're adult pets or adult creatures. And 88% of them in this, this, um, this facility in Virginia were euthanized once they were brought into this facility. You know, that's a, that's a 30% increase from last year. This was from 2014, uh, so 88% were killed in 2015. These are these are numbers that are surprisingly high to me, and so my assumption is that this is a a, a bit of a push in the high. You know, like when you hear somebody with the statistic, they they try to go for the highest possible number. And um, the Center for Consumer Freedom is the group that is doing a lot of this data announcing against PETA and the Center for Consumer Freedom has a few people in it that are a bit fishy. And so that's one of the reasons why that this is, um, this is a little bit, uh, when, when we talk about all of the data and every information that keeps being reported against PETA is saying that PETA is like one of the, um, the things that I found on Snopes is that they're saying that so- Peter workers are stealing family pets and then euthanizing them. Well, Snopes found this as a mixture of truth and false. The it's false that PETA workers routinely lure pets away from families for the sole purpose of euthanizing the animals. Like that doesn't that's not that's not true. But what happened was a few people acted badly and killed a few pets in alleged thefts or euthanization of family pets when they weren't supposed to. And those were construed by the Center for Consumer Freedom as that is the new point, of that is what PETA does. And so th- that truth needed to be brought out. And so that's what Snopes does a lot of times. But the Center for Consumer Freedom, they have th- this guy, th- it's a group that's been around for a while. They're a nonprofit. But um, the main guy who uh, runs the whole thing, his name is Richard Berman, and he's the leader of the whole thing. Well, he has a history of really attacking specific movements and messages and things. And he has taken on PETA and a number of other groups and organizations whose points of view could have an impact on the profits of his clients. And so this guy is kind of sort of associated with big agriculture and stuff. So he wants PETA to be hurt a little bit. This is some of the conspiracy stuff that people say is happening here. So we don't really know. I I would have to dive into 
the, whether or not this guy is tied up with taxes, like the Panama Papers we reported. But it's just it's strange that this big money guy is really attacking PETA, and it happens to be um, their fast food industry concessions, where fast food is changing the way it does stuff because PETA is fighting for animal rights. And so I I would say that you know PETA is doing some good things with that. But this weird euthanization thing is what yeah. people are calling as a – it's like a, almost a semi-hypocrisy. Well, yeah. And so we have, to, we have to be skeptical of the people who are reporting against PETA, the Center for Consumer Freedom, because I don't trust them very much. I'm just skeptical of their, their snarky ways. But it, it does seem that PETA is doing some – you know, taking – eating the cake and <laughs> – Well, well there was a – there's an article in Huffington Post, and, and I'll be honest. I'm pretty skeptical yeah, of that's the guy. Huffington Post, but he's, he's the one that put out there that PETA is taking in, I don't know, 51000 <laughs> or $52,000 in contributions, and then they're selling 600 and so thousand dollars, and then they make interest on dividends, and he's giving all these big numbers to basically say they finish with $4.5 million in the bank. And then he turns around and yeah. says there's another society in Virginia that took in the exact same number of pets as PETA, but they saved 94% of them versus the 30 I think it was what 32% that PETA saved. And 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 that's yeah, the, so, that's the thing is it, to me, okay, so you know what? That's a fair conversation, right? That's a fair fair, fair mm-hmm. point because if they re- if PETA is really taking in that many people and it's it's all become a money scheme, it's it's no better than a political screen, scheme. And and they can throw blood on on think or you know whatever coats they want. And it doesn't matter because if they're making money off doing that, that's bullshit. Their whole point is, yeah. is, to, is, is, is to service the pets. Their whole point is, is to stop the murders. And if they're yep. banking so four the, and a half million fucking dollars, can't, you think they could put a couple of fucking <laughs> ads out there? I'll adopt another fucking dog. Hell, at the amount of profits they're making, they could probably pay me $5,000 a year to adopt another fucking dog. They could probably do that and afford to, to do that to almost everybody in my fucking neighborhood. Yeah, it's it's one of the things when a when a, a non profit or a charitable group, let's say PETA, you know, it's a foundation, all that kind of stuff, when they have people who are making large sums of money and they have like these once money starts getting involved, it's it's kind of loses its point. You're like really, well that you're you're in it for the money now, not so much your charitable. Like, otherwise, why would you, I mean why would you need this massive sum of money? And that that's a conversation that usually happens for the corruption of money and stuff. But this guy that uh, you mentioned from the Huffington Post, his name is Nathan J. Winograd, and he is the No Kill Advocacy Center, and he is one of the people that is completely against killing animals at all and he's one of the ones that really like this he's an he's an iconoclast he's ideological to the point where it's like a complete bias against any kind of mercy killing of animals at all and he is constantly with his no kill advocate center attacking 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 and some of the stuff that he latches on is some of the stuff that snopes is like yeah well this isn't really completely true like he's one of the people that is he's he's just throwing things at PETA to see what sticks and so i'm skeptical of some of the numbers some of the sources that he had for the number of kills and the stuff that has to be reported to the state those are great pieces of information and uh, especially some of the numbers of how much money is moved around because that's through taxes information and stuff like that but like another one of the things that I found is uh, <laughs> the website makes me totally like, uh, but it's petakillsanimals.com. And they have a list of the number of animals uh, transferred, adopted, and killed. And so like essentially how many are adopted out of the total number that uh, they are received and then they transfer out of their kill, sh- out of their kill shelters or then they get adopted. And these are, these, I mean, these are decent numbers: two thousand, two thousand six hundred, eighteen hundred. You know, these these are pretty small numbers if you think about how fast cats can reproduce and dogs can reproduce. But it's still, it, they're they're still euthanizing these things. So I guess what we wanted to just bring out is that. What do you guys think? What does anyone else think? They want to get into a conversation with us about this. Make some comments. Do you think PETA's being hypocritical here? Do you think they're being a little bit rational um, and not being as crazy as a lot of people like to think PETA is? Do you think this 
the no kill advocacy group is, is spot on that you should not be killing animals in any way, shape or form and treating it just like we treat humans where there's no such thing as a, as a, uh, a mercy killing or a helpful euthanasia. So this is, this is, we don't know the answer here. I don't know the answer. I don't know who's completely 100% trustworthy, but I thought it was a really interesting topic and it, it caught me by surprise because I didn't expect Peter to be euthanizing stuff. So if you want to get into conversation, you can talk to us on Facebook, on Twitter, and we'll, we'll try to get into it and we can go from there. We'll post all the links in the description. There's a of lot. this show. Yeah, <laughs> Hannah has <laughs> Hannah sent me a message at, tonight, and he's like, yeah, I got, like, uh, two new articles. I got just – it's just it's, – you just browse through them. You can have a conversation about it with me. And next <laughs> thing you know, I'm reading through five different articles and spending all my damn free time having a conversation with him. But it's a good conversation. I think it's important to recognize the difference, you know, between what – shelters want and if we're just donating money to another mega corporation because i don't agree with that and i have a hard time um accepting that and 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 maybe it's you know as we'll talk about in a few minutes maybe it's my upbringing you know my desire to say no because of some of my childhood circumstances but maybe it's because in reality it's just really fucking wrong (laughs) <laughs> well, maybe also we'll have an answer to this entire situation because you brought up the, the consciousness aspect. Once we have a way to quantify consciousness, if we ever do, you know, that would really ease this situation. We can quantify whether or not an animal has a legitimate consciousness. That would be awesome. But it's still, we don't know if we'll ever have that. But those kinds of things are something in the future, paying attention to neurology and psychology and and any of the other ologies that have to deal with the brain, we may have an answer for this in the future. So keep an eye on science, and hopefully we'll figure it out. And I agree. So make sure you stick around for another segment of Cellar Door Skeptics, because we're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, we're going to be talking with author of 1324 about his experiences, his desires to write a book, and child abuse. We'll be right back with more Cellar Door Skeptics. Hey, what's up? I'm Steve Hayes. And I'm Dave Curry. And we're from ProfitCast. And you're listening to Cellar Door Skeptics. On the Fox News Network. They're not affiliated with Fox. Everyone's a Fox affiliate. Looking for something new and exciting? Or maybe just a change from the old atheist show format? Cellar Door Skeptics Podcast provides listeners with hours of enjoyment each week on Spreaker and iTunes. Check us out as we talk politics, religion, science, reviews, books, and music, along with the occasional interview just for a twist. Join Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they bring fresh content to you. Walk with us through the cellar door as we help you prepare for the revolution. You can find us on Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, and even on Facebook. Hey, my name is Jeremiah. And this is David from the God Theory Podcast. And you're listening to Cellar Door Skeptics. Prepare for the revolution. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to Cellar Door Skeptics. Thank you so much for sticking around. Um, this segment is going to be a little bit more serious. We have a fun topic to begin with, and now this topic is going to be a little bit more serious. But what we wanted to do is pay tribute to National Child Abuse Prevention Month this year. And we've been trying to champion some other causes and bring attention to other awarenesses that we feel need to happen. And given my background and how I grew up, this was one that kind of touches home a little bit. And so what we thought better than to interview an individual from a book that I recently reread. The book's name is 1324 by M. Dolan Hickman. He is a child abuse survivor, a writer, and an anti-abuse activist. He married his wife in 2007 and has one daughter. He dedicates most of his time and skills to advocating on behalf of mistreated children, often in cooperation with children's rights groups and other advocates. His writing has been applied or amplified on different news websites like Alternet, Salon, and the Spiritual Abuse Survivors Blog Network. His book is a very personal journey. It is a work of fiction, but one that is based on many different stories that have come to light in the last 10 years. So please, welcome to the program, our guest, M. Dolan Hickman. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you tonight? 
I'm doing very well. Thank you, Chris. It's great to be speaking to you. Yeah, and you'll have to forgive me. I, I am not good with names, so I do butcher people's names uh, very often, <laughs> and I don't try to. You'll hear him just pause. He'll pause for a second and just like try to figure it out and just like force it out. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> well, that was that was perfectly fine. It's M. Dolan Hickman, and I'm the author of 1324, A Story of Faith and Obsession. And, and I, originally I heard about your book um, from a friend of mine, Vicki Garrison, and she she had been posting about it recently, and you know, I <clears throat> I thought, what better than to message the author and say, hey, can we have a conversation about your book? And you and I went back and forth for a few minutes, and then you said, hey, I'd love to come on your show, let's set a date, yada, yada, yada. And then, you know, I said, well, this would be good, a good, a good conversation to have with my other co-hosts as well. And so I thought, what better, what better of a way to engage the audience than to bring you on, talk about the origins of your book, how you wrote it, and kind of what's going on in your life uh, for the next book, I'm assuming, that you'll eventually write. And so why don't you give everybody a little bit of an overview about the book that you wrote? Okay, so where where do you start? It starts so far back. Um, I started working on I started working on doing um, children's advocacy around probably in two thousand and six, and initially, you know, I was I was a I guess I need to go back even further. I was raised in a fundamentalist Christian home. My parents joined a Baptist church when I was around three years old, and our pastor was very um, adamant about the use of the rod and about breaking the will of the child and um, so my home life very drastically changed from the time that my parents were saved and came into the church and I experienced and my brother my older brother also experienced severe physical abuse witnessed you know uh, domestic violence in the home my parents eventually um, separated temporarily so um, my mom kind of was the was was never completely on board with what was coming from the church, and so she fought against it, and eventually did convince my father to leave that church. So my experience is a little different from a lot of other people because it was confined to the years between when I was around three till when I was around nine, and um, so that that kind of happened as as a child, and then. then when I was older, I was around 25, I had a secondary trauma that brought back these um, these memories about being physically abused as a very young child. So, you know, the first thing that I did was I called my older brother on the phone and I said, I'm having these recollections and I'm remembering these things that are horrible and I, I just can't even believe that that's something that would happen. And my brother said to me, you know, that's that what you're remembering is the least of it. And so that was kind of the the really the beginning of the novel for me began with a therapist who said what you need to begin doing is these memories from, you know, a lot of them from my preschool age, you know, age four, five, six. He said you need to begin journaling and writing down the memories so that you can begin to put your life story in order and understand what happened. And so um, I was working on those journals over a period of several years and then eventually started working in activism, trying to bring attention to particularly the, the problem of physical abuse within fundamentalist Christian families. And eventually uh, I kind of, I came to a point of realizing that there was a lot of research that was being done and a lot of writing being done on the subject of child abuse, but what happens is that most of it doesn't get read by the general public. And so I had the idea that what I wanted to do is to take some of my personal experiences and some of the things that I'd learned through doing what my, what my therapist called bibliotherapy, which is just reading um, scholarly articles and professional books about post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, about trauma and recovery. So I wanted to take all this information and put it together into a format that would be accessible for the average person to read. So the result was 1324, and what it is is a mystery murder thriller about a 
um, a fan of a gothic heavy metal band who goes on a murdering spree. And this kicks off a police investigation that eventually uncovers a whole sordid underworld linked to human trafficking and a fundamentalist uh, televangelist with political connections to the right wing. And um, it's just kind of a it's a it's a big amalgamation of all of these things, but you know it presents all of this information in a way that is exciting and interesting, but at the same time is factually accurate. And and I'll admit, reading through your book, it was um it was a challenge. You know, I probably did not have as aggressive of a discipline nature growing up, but you know, my parents and you know my my aunts and uncles they prescribe to some of that, you know, it, I believe the book was called like to train up a child or something like that was popular when I was a younger child. And so, you know, reading through your book brings back, you know, different memories of, of things that happen to relatives and, you know, things you hear about as a kid and you see and things that happen to you that you don't process in the same way. And um, I think you did a very personally, I think you did a very good job bringing the book down to a standard that was easily digestible um, but still allowed the message to remain constant. Well, I mean, that's one of the really unfortunate things about, you know, pu publishing the book and the popularity that it has had it is, you know, now the book is in libraries all around the world as far away as Zurich, Switzerland. And, you know, we've sold lots and lots of e-books and paper, paperback copies. And now I get regularly you know, contacts on Facebook and by email from other people that are writing to say this really represented my upbringing. And, you know, the, the, the really sad part is, you know, in my case, I think that if I sit and describe what I experienced, people say, yes, that's abuse. That's very clearly, you know, over the top. But for a lot of other people, they have very similar problems with processing through you know the the physical punishment that they had to put up with as kids but there isn't a social recognition at all that that was something that was harmful and so you know that is you know one of the one of the worst things about being in the position that I'm in is is getting contacted by other people that have had those experiences and it's really sad how prevalent it actually is and you know some of the some of the discussions and and I don't want to reveal too much of the book cuz I want people to go out and purchase the book and read it and you guys can purchase it we'll post links in the description to this episode for this book um I I got mine on Amazon that's probably the easiest way in my opinion to get it it's on Kindle I believe you also have hard copies um and like you said it's at the library if somebody wants to go and read it there but one of the one of the big things, you know, one of the big environments that I, I noticed out of the movie is is the Baptist thing, and that's how I grew up. I grew up a Baptist, you know, like I was a Baptist since birth. Um, it was something that you know, even my parents still to this day are somewhat um, Baptist. Now they don't practice as strict of an upbringing as what we we had growing up. But I had a friend um, in high school, well, not in high school, but in junior high and in, in elementary school. And my friend, you know, his father was a very disciplinarian. And there's one scene in the book where, you know, as a teenager, or Josh has to, or Josh's friend Mike has to leave the room. He has to walk out of the room, and Josh basically gets a punishment. And I remember growing up as a kid, it's one of those things, you know, my buddy would want me to stay the whole weekend. And it didn't matter what would happen because his father wouldn't punish him in front of me. But he would come to school the next day limpy, and he would tell me things. And, and you know, I never – I saw those things as, as a little outrageous. I mean, you know, I got spanked quite heavily as a kid, but not to the point of, you know, some of the things he would tell me. And, you know, reading your book kind of brings back all these memories. It's like, shit, I haven't thought about this individual, you know, in, in over 10 years. And, and, you know, but his upbringing – and it was the same school system. You know, we went to school together. We were friends. We hung out. We had sleepovers at each other's house. And, you know, some of that – your your book helped bring to light because I think that's a hard story for a lot of people to tell, even if they don't, even if they want to come out and say it. That's not an easy thing to um, have a conversation about. Well, I think I I spent a lot of time. You know, if you I, what I would say is, if I sat down to research a book and write a book, I would probably not be able to do as thorough a job as I did because of my own personal interest in the subject matter and 
the the because it it involved me personally, I spent just years looking through other people's stories and in support groups talking to other people about what had happened to them and reading the scientific literature. And, you know, I have a collection of dozens and dozens of Christian parenting manuals and reading through those. And, you know, one of the things that's in the novel is, you know, the the handwritten notes that are in the margins of these parenting manuals, a lot of them become um, part of the curriculum at a church. And so you have uh, a pastor or some other um, church elder who's teaching a class about how to whip your children. And it's very revealing to see, you know, so I have all of the things that are in the novel are actually in books that I possess. None of those are things that I invented. They're either quotes directly from the book and the handwritten notes that are mentioned in the book are actually from uh, books that I found, you know, in the thrift stores or in used bookstores where, you know, parents have let these books go. And now we have these just intimate you know, looks into the these other families. So one of the things I tried to do in the story was to have characters that represented every point of view about the issue. So you had mentioned, you know, Josh in the story. Josh is the son of a uh, minister, and over the course of the story, uh, this minister grows to become a famous author of a Christian parenting manual, and he becomes involved in uh, right-wing national politics and his ministry grows and he becomes very successful financially at the same time his son is dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder and drug and alcohol addiction and suicide attempts and all of the you know negative fallout that comes from being exposed to you know a type of of ritual punishment that is you know, is very detrimental to people. It's traumatic and it's, you know, it's over the top compared to what most people would consider to be spanking. And so, you know, but not every character in the story is going to have that experience. You know, the, the, every character in the story discusses at some point their relationship to that issue. And, you know, some of the characters do have a positive, you know, report about, you know, their parents using, physical discipline and others have, you know, various degrees of negativity associated with it. So I tried to really kind of just, I think anyone who picks it up is going to see themselves in it somewhere. And that's, you know, intentional is I want people to understand that, you know, there, my experience does not invalidate someone else's experience any more than their experience invalidates mine. These are all experiences that different people have. And so, you know, corporal punishment and physical discipline within the church is not experienced the same way by everybody. And that's something that I think needs to, you know, needs to be pointed out that just because it didn't happen that way in your family doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. And I think what you just said is exactly right, is a lot of people who grew up in you know, evangelical and fundamentalist households, they may not have experienced physical abuse themselves, but they were aware of it going on in their church. And, you know, they had friends or other family members who were dealing with that. So do you, do you feel, and, and we can get, we can get a little farther into the book and maybe how you did the research in a minute, but do you feel, you know, your book kind of touches on a famous person, you know, that comes to light named Alan, right? And, you know, he basically writes a book about how to discipline your child. Well, there is a book called How to Train Up a Child or To Train Up a Child, I believe. And that was a book that was prevalent in circles that my parents ran in. It was brought into our church. Now, we never had a pastor come in and hawk the book you know, or anything like that. But that was a book that, that showed up as a unique tool to how to discipline your children moving forward. Now, luckily, when I was real little, I wasn't as bad as, um, you know, maybe some other people were. And, you know, I didn't get disciplined quite as aggressively, but I remember, you know, in my, my cousin's house, seeing some of these different type of behaviors happen. You just, again, you just, you see these things and you don't think about it. But do you, is your book based somewhat or does it reference somewhat that specific book or is it just kind of generalizing as an overview um, different Christian books that fit to that category? Well, I mean, obviously all of the quotes that are in the novel that refer to the book by the fictional character, uh, Pastor Alan Garnfield, 
all of those quotes are paraphrased from actual Christian parenting manuals. So those are are taken. Some of them are taken from um, "To Train Up a Child" by Michael and Debbie Pearl. Some of them are taken from "God the Rod in Your Child's Bod" by Larry Tomzak. Some are from Ted Tripp's "Shepherding a Child's Heart." Some of them are from James Dobson's uh, "Dare to Discipline." Um, there's, you know, there's the strong will child by D Dobson is another one that's in there. So, you know, the thing to me is that in doing the research of reading through these books, what you find is that Michael and De Debbie Pearl are very popular at the moment, but they are just the, kind of the Johnny Cun Latelys of this school of thought. If you go back. Uh, J. Richard Fugit was writing what the Bible says about child training was written back in the 70s, and Dare to Discipline was written in the 70s. If you go back even further, you're going to find um, books like The Christian Family. Uh, that's by, gosh, what's the guy's name? Let me look at it. That's by Larry Christensen. And it's the same stuff in all of them. I mean, this is information. That's one of the points of the novel is that, you know, it's really kind of... You know, there's a whole group of people that have cropped up to protest against the, the pearls and their ministry, No Greater Joy. And, you know, that's completely appropriate for people to be opposing them because what they do is advocate, you know, very, very strict forms of physical discipline that have resulted in a lot of people being injured and harmed. And even in several cases, followers of their writing have literally murdered their children. So, you know, that's that's definitely a problem, but at the same time, you know, you have to take you have to realize that one of the ways that this kind of thinking perpetuates itself is that as each particular prophet or proponent of this thinking, their their school of thought is within the generation is exposed for what it is, because as the children who are reared this way become adults the complaints of physical abuse begin to surface and very quickly that author becomes maligned as a person who endorses abuse. And so they fall out of favor and they're quickly replaced by someone else who's teaching the same thing with slightly different wording. And, you know, you hear the, the these fine line distinctions. They'll say, you know, first you had to break the will of the child and now they say that you have to you have to shape the will without breaking the spirit and it, it, it when you boil it down nothing has changed the only thing that they're doing is they're adding legal boilerplate that excuses their ministry from the you know the legal and ethical consequences of a teaching a practice that all too often turns out to be pouring gasoline on a problem of physical abuse that is already in a family or is instigating abusive behavior in a family that didn't have it to begin with. Well, it sounds a lot like the uh, intelligent design word changing from creationism to intelligent design, playing with the legal stuff to try to make it more, um, I guess, more palatable for the, the general masses. And, oh, this is a new thing because it has a new word, but you're basically scratching up the same um, the same terrible uh, direction. I personally come to this not from the religious background. It's one of the things that, like, these types of stories and reading through this book is – I have a hard time believing a lot of times this stuff really does exist because my life, I didn't experience any of it. My father did, but I, he, he said, that's not the life that I'm going to get. And so I recently had a daughter and like the book that I've been going through is it's a scientific style. It's brain rules for baby. It's a guy named John Medina and it's taken a bit, you know, child ring from infants and older in a very scientific perspective. And I can't really think of any other way that I would ever raise a child. So like when I hear these stories and when I read through this stuff, it, it reminds me as a non-believer or someone who's never experienced it, that this stuff really does exist. And so it's something that I should concentrate on. It's something that I should pay attention to and maybe get involved with uh, some of these types of situations. So I guess for, for uh, my perspective for this book particularly, it's a great place for people who have never experienced it to kind of really get a visceral feel of what's happening. Because you mentioned that everybody kind of can kind of see themselves somewhere in the story. But seriously, 
if you've never experienced it, this is like, it like shows like take the movie Taken and things like examples where you can kind of get a feel to, you know, the sexual um, exploitation industry is a really horrible thing. And so my basically where I wanted to take the next question for you is so when you're um, when you're researching this stuff to try to make it as real as possible to try to really get into what it's like you mentioned in the there's a huge disclaimer at the beginning of the book, by the way, um, that that you talk about when you were doing the research for post-traumatic stress disorder, some of the ways in which people, these symptoms manifest, how deep into the science did you particularly get so that you can try to make those symptoms real? Well, I'll tell you, um, I, I have been living with post-traumatic stress disorder since around the age of five and was not diagnosed. You know, one of the things with PTSD is it's very, it, it has a cluster of symptoms that can mimic a lot of other mental illness. So I was diagnosed with major depression, with anxiety disorders, and with insomnia. There was a time where I was taking nine different psychiatric medications every day to treat various different misdiagnosed mental illnesses. And, you know, once we zeroed in on the fact that it was actually, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, I experienced a secondary trauma, which I wrote about at No Longer Quivering. If someone wanted to go um, Google M. Dolan Hickman, and it's M-D-O-L-O-N-H-I-C-K-M-O-N. You'll find uh, an article called The Survivor's Conversation with Christianity. And in that, I go into a little more detail about the, you know, the trauma that kicked off all of the, the process of really dealing with these memories. And, you know, you hate to say repressed memory because that isn't really the case that it's not remembered, but, you know, what happens is that the abuse stopped when I was nine years old, and then it was just never discussed. My parents didn't, you know, we were never debriefed after leaving the cult that they were in. And so, you know, it just kind of drifted away from memory and became, you know, th there was no reason to think about it. So, you know, my, my therapist eventually said, you know, <clears throat> I went through three or four and they eventually came to the conclusion, they said, you're dealing with a problem where you're just generally hostile to people in a position of authority, and it's a problem for your treatment because you're angry at the doctor who's trying to help. And so what they said is, we would like for you to read these books. And so I would go to the therapist, and he would give me a book to read, and I would read about post-traumatic stress and then come back, and he would give me another book to read. So I went through a period of several years where I was just reading and studying and, you know, gaining insight about myself. And, you know, so as I, as I went to start writing my novel, I wanted to share that information. And one of the things that uh, Chris just mentioned is the visceral sense. When you're reading a novel, it allows you to be inside the mind of another person. And one of the scenes in the book that is is just phenomenal is the the main character is having a post traumatic stress um, an episode, and as a reader, you're sitting inside of his mind and you're feeling what it feels like to to have that happen. But at the same time, his therapist is there explaining the step by step scientific me mechanism by which all of this is taking place. So the reader not only gets the, you know, a semester of abnormal psychology <laughs> to understand, you know, neurologically what is post-traumatic stress disorder and how is it different for people who experience trauma as children than for people who experience trauma as adults. But you also get to kind of see what does that feel like. Instead of a list of symptoms, you get to live through it and and yet also have the medical information. So one of the things I was very fortunate to have was a trauma researcher, a lady named uh, Kim Etherington, and she is a uh, Bristol University emeritus professor. She's published dozens of articles on trauma and childhood trauma and specifically working with male survivors of abuse. And so she was one of the very first readers of the book and gave me an endorsement, which was very important in the early stages because I am not a doctor. I don't have the medical credential to present that information, but all of the 
medical information that is in the book has been read and vetted by experts so that people who are reading it can be confident that what they're reading is a, a, an accurate representation of what scientists in the medical community understand about trauma. Well, that's um, basically what I wanted to get is like that is a big thing in this story that I really I really thought was really, really well done. You did a very nice job explaining the scientific aspects of things. And then um, to take it a little bit further, or at least to another another uh, perspective is I've been reading through the, the reviews and you get a lot of positive uh, reviews from people who surprisingly are quite religious. And so the, the, the message that you're giving is basically that, you know, this this kind of corporal punishment is bad. So could you, I guess, explain or uh, go over some of the events maybe that you've experienced with having both ends of the spectrum, non-believers and very devout believers saying that, yes, this is something that we need to fix in our community or to basically the, the experiences that you've had on, because we are non-believers here. In, in most cases, we usually find these types of things horrific but the, the, the I, I was surprised to find really really religious people saying that yes this is a great book and that um, I really like the uh, the message that it has well again you know I wrote with the with the thought of reforming the church and you know my my starting point was with the idea that this really is a small subset of of fundamentalist Christians and they the the people who are abusing their children in the name of God are 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 getting away with it largely because they managed to blend in with a larger group of people and and to some extent they are blending in with other fundamentalist Christians who have not looked deeply into what they're talking about so when someone says spanking or giving your kid a whipping or a paddling that makes a certain image for you depending on your upbringing and it it may be anywhere from the most mild slap on the hand to you know there are people who comment on articles that I post who say I was whipped and I had bloody you know scabs and blisters and couldn't sleep on my back at night and it was hilarious my parents were just great so, you know, the the experiences of people really run the gamut. And, you know, that's kind of I think the eventually what you come to is that what needs to happen is that people need to develop a different grammar for talking about these issues because using a word like spanking allows a lot of abuse to be lumped in and treated as if it is the same as a lot of less severe types of punishment and you know eventually if you if you think about it long enough what I will say is I meet people whose parents according to anything that you would hear you would say they were very normal about how they disciplined their children physically and yet the the kids or the adult children of these parents have a lot of incredible psychiatric problems related to that and eventually what you kinda have to realize is I'm not really in a position to judge anyone else's experience what they experienced if they felt that it was traumatic to them then it was and if they didn't think that it was traumatic, then, you know, who, who am I to question that either? But, you know, one person's experience does not negate the other. And, you know, re realistically what you're looking at is something that is akin to a drug or medication that has a unpredictable side effect that it causes a major lifelong illness in a small subset of the people who are given this medication and it's dangerous because there's no way to know which of the people who receive that medicine are going to suffer this consequence and you know if you had a medicine like that that was being offered for sale we used to have a, a decongestant called PPA and three people had a stroke and the FDA <laughs> pulled it off the market 
And the reason wasn't that three people had a stroke, but because there was no way to put a warning on the package that would tell people who might have a stroke when they take this decongestant. And, you know, that's one, one of the things that I really want to bring attention to is, you know, it's, it's one thing, you know, to there are a lot of people that are going to universally condemn anybody spanking their kid ever under any circumstance. And I think that's the, that's the logical end point that you come to after talking to a lot of people who are mentally ill because of this type of punishment is that as a parent, and I have a four-year-old myself, I don't want to expose myself to something that has an, a, a chance, however small, that it's going to leave her with a permanent lifelong illness. And yeah. there's no way of knowing who that's going to, you know, there's no way of knowing who's going to be affected that way. That's one of the things that's really surprising is that um, you really can, even to a normal small series of uh, punishments or uh, I guess it, it, punishment is probably the best word. I've, I've never really had any spankings or anything like that, but just some people really, really, really are much more effective than others. And so the, 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 the danger of one or two little bits actually making a big difference in someone's life as opposed to someone who's who is it, it was a great thing for them um the risk of that danger is obviously outweighs you know the the benefits i would say in a lot of those cases but um you know one of, i'm gonna interrupt you a second there you know to a point though there when we talk about the addiction aspect of it we look at some of the different things about how people grew up and what's ingrained in you you know i grew up being spanked I thought nothing of it when I had my first child. It, it it didn't dawn on me that there was anything wrong with it. You know, even though, you know, I wasn't technically an atheist at the time, you know, I had left the faith. I had, you know, started researching my own path. You know, I enjoyed um, partying and, you know, women and, you know, learning about evolution, you know, after I was left the church. But you you don't think about the spanking thing until you know after if you start reading stories like yours and, and and vibing yourself in it. I mean, I spanked my kid for a little while, not to the extent that um you received, but you know my kid got spanked. And I remember before I became an atheist, I used to threaten my kid when I was a child. My parents would threaten me with, you know what you got to do? You're going to read this Bible until you can repent of your sins. And I remember thinking when I had problems with my son, I would sit him down and be like, here, you're going to read this Bible. And, you know, now I look back on it and I go, that was horrible of me. And I've had to sit my kids down and be like, I'm very sorry. You know, there's issues I have from the past that come up in my daily life. And, you know, I don't spank my kids anymore. But that that thought process, is, is that's a hard fucking cycle to break. Well, I think that, you know, if you're an atheist, no one is an atheist in one step. Or very few people. Most people get there through a series of events. And, you know, that to me is to, to expect that you're going to say to anyone, you know, let, let's outlaw spanking and put people in prison for doing this when so many people have had that experience growing up and they're not, you know, they're not scarred and they're not having problems because of it. You know, it defies logic and their own experience. And, you know, that to me was one of the starting points of, you know, realizing that writing essays and sharing statistics and scientific, you know, studies, it doesn't convince people because they have their own experience with this subject. And that personal experience overweighs all the evidence. And so, you know, the only way to communicate with them is that I need for them to understand my experience and what that experience is like for a lot of other people that, you know, where, where probably the easiest thing that I can say is if you get, if you grow up in a home and you're physically abused, you don't dare to be upset about it. The, the consequence of expressing displeasure at anything that your parents do or say is so severe being whipped with a belt and being told what you have to think and what you have to believe. And you think to yourself, well, sure, you could lie. But the thing is, as a little kid, you don't dare to lie because if you are caught lying, 
the consequence is so extreme. So when the parent says, I want you to say, I deserve this, it's not enough to mouth the words. You have to believe that you deserve it. And, you know, this is a part of, you know, expressing to other people that, you know, if you haven't had that experience, everybody in our culture is involved in this because your um, your society gives the message to children who are being abused that this is normal. When a comedian makes a joke and makes light of physical abuse, when they compare a spanking to physical abuse in a joke, so somewhere there is a child listening to that and they are taking away from it the message that being beaten bloody is something that happens to everybody. And, you know, within the, it, it's not just within the church. And I think I, I tried in the, in my novel to make the point that, you know, within the church, they are so focused on what adults will think of what they're saying that they can't, think about the fact that children are overhearing all of these sermons. Every message that's going out about corporal punishment and spanking and child abuse is also being heard by children who are experiencing violence and trauma at the hands of their parent. And when our language is, it, we're using a big word like spanking that covers so many different behaviors that do not resemble each other from one family to the other. And so when someone says, I support spanking, but I don't support child abuse, what they're not realizing is that what you consider child abuse is spanking in a lot of other families. And if you don't believe me, go and read the comments on some articles about Adrian Peterson who took a stick and whipped his son on his testicles until the boy was bleeding. And there are so many people in the comments supporting the parents and saying that the fact that this four-year-old was bloody and black and blue and had injuries on his genitals is typical of what spanking is like in families, whether they say in black families or in southern families or in Christian families. There are a lot of families where what you think of as being grotesque is within their culture completely normal. And so, you know, that's part of the problem of the discussion and the debate is the lack of a common vocabulary to describe what is being discussed. So what we're looking at here, basically, this, this book is an amalgamation. It's a culmination of your entire life, your experiences, all kinds of other experiences you've learned about and read about. And this is a massive undertaking that, I mean, your entirety is inside of this entire message and everything. So let's say there's people out there who have the same kind of thing. It, it, it could be associated with this kind of situation. It could be a story they really think they need to tell for the non-believe community, for the ag agnostic community for any type of spe specific message they want to get out like you have with your book. You basically wrote this and then you decided you were going to do a Kickstarter and that's how you got the ball rolling. Maybe you just give us a couple of quick cliff notes on kind of how you got the process started and whether or not you think it was the best way to do it in hindsight to help maybe someone else, some little guy, some blogger who wants to uh, maybe write a book one day and decides that he wants to do the independent publishing route. Okay, so the, the, the beginning of all that is that I knew as I sat down to write, I wanted to write something that would fit into the genre of the murder thriller. My wife is a big fan of the Law and Order SVU and NCIS and all of these types of forensic shows. And I wanted to f create something that would fit into that and that would be accessible to those people that would look and feel like one of those TV programs. But I also was not willing to follow, you know, in the in in publishing and books and television, there's a certain formula that you're supposed to follow when you're talking about child abuse, and that is that you show everything that leads up to 
the abuse, and then the door closes and the camera pans away and they play some sad music. And, you know, when we return, that's the end of it. So what you have is the, the person who is, you know, the victim whose life is the most affected by all of this in most of these stories, they, they get one monologue to talk about the abuse, what happened, and how it has affected them. And the stories center around the detectives and, you know, other characters besides the victims. So I wanted to create something that focused on the victims and that, you know, get, made the victim of the story not a prop for, you know, creating the tension for the, sh for the series, but rather were, were central to the story. I also kind of knew that, you know, sending that out to be published was not going to be, you know, probably was not, what I, what I was afraid of was that people were going to want me to soften the message of the story and some of the gritty details of it in order to make it more like what the public was used to seeing. So I decided very early on that I was going to do it, you know, to publish independently. So in 2013, I started a Kickstarter campaign and we, well, the first thing I would say is that I had spent five years basically in a closet writing this novel by myself. And when I started the Kickstarter campaign, I didn't have a Facebook profile. I didn't have a Twitter account. I didn't have any followers or friends. I hadn't been, you know, I had done some publishing with the Center for Effective Discipline, you know, years earlier. But once I started on the novel, it really kind of crowded out all of the other activism and publishing that I had done. And so when I came back into it, I basically had no following. So that made it very hard, but, you know, one of the people that very early on jumped on board with me was Vicki Garrison. I sent a tweet, tweet to her, and she was immediately intrigued. And within a few days, I had been booked to do a couple of different radio appearances, and I published uh, a Survivor's Conversation with Christianity on the No Longer Quivering blog, and then that was noticed by a... Um, on-air personality at a Christian radio station in Seattle. So I was on the radio there, and long story short, we raised about $5,300, and I was able to hire an award-winning cover designer to put the cover together. And I sent out through the Editor's Freelance Association a, a solicitation for an editor. I had more than 60 people apply and was fortunate enough to have a lady named Miranda Ottawell, who is a 30-year um, industry veteran. She's edited books for many, many best-selling authors. And she had a heart for the project and was willing to put her efforts in there for the amount of money that I was able to pay. So in 2014, the book was um, recognized by Publishers Weekly, got a starred review in Publishers Weekly, and appeared as the first book in the mystery thriller category of their annual best books of 2014. So I would say, I mean, overall, I can't, I mean, I'm blown away by how successful the book has been. It's been, you know, picked up in libraries all around the world and we've sold a lot of paper copies and even more ebook copies. So it's been very, very successful as an outreach and, you know, still is this, uh, this April was our third relaunch and the book was number one on the Kindle store in a couple of categories. It peaked at number 41 in the mystery thriller category, which is astounding for a self-published book, and was one of seven self-published stars from publishers, name, named by Publishers Weekly, one of seven self-published stars for 2014. So it's, you know, for a, for a book about child abuse, it has accomplished a lot. You know, I, I think if I had wanted to get rich and famous, I should have written something with an easier subject matter. <laughs> you know, with the amount of effort and energy that's gone into, you know, marketing and outreach, I think if I'd had something a little more palatable, pa palatable I probably would have made a lot more money for myself as it is. You know, I take all of the, all of the money that we get from books sales goes back into doing more advertising. So, you know, we're spending money doing email blasts and spending money on um, targeted advertising on Amazon on a constant basis. So when you check in and you see that the book is, you know, 
number 17 or number 25 on the child abuse chart, the reason that it stays on the chart is because all of the royalty money that comes in from the book is being turned around and put back out into advertising to to get the message out to more people. And then, of course, I'm also doing you know shows like this one and byline articles and anything else that I can do because the purpose of the book is to, you know, as you just said, it's, it's my whole life is packed up into that book and everything that I've learned is there. And the book is my message. You know, I, I'm not going to rewrite what I did in a hundred thousand words and put it out on the internet as an essay. You know, it's a big idea. When, when you get the, uh, the, the movie, the movie rights you ought to come back by and gloat a little bit because i'd go check this movie out man if if uh they ever had a story or something that came along and as far as the visual medium to get something out there it would be a, it would be a difficult movie to watch but the, uh, the i've seen a lot of directors that are willing to touch subject matter and content and things that are really important lately and i think this would be a good one hopefully you get out there for that that'd be awesome well, one of the one of the very first things that happened when the book was first released, I got a, a positive review in Kirkus Magazine, which is like the Pepsi to Publishers Weekly's Coke, and I got a Facebook friend request from the owner of a major Hollywood studio, and he had read the review in Kirkus and was interested in getting a copy of the book. So when you had asked whether there was anything I would do differently, you know. I was really confirmed. I have had, because of the, the success of the book, I've had several different film studios request screening copies. I've had publishing companies request screening copies. And the word that comes back is that it's so gritty. And mm-hmm. there is, the, and you know, the thing is, is none of, none of what's in it is gratuitous or exploitive. So you can't cut it without destroying the story. And, you know, so that's uh, uh, that's the reason I didn't get to sell the film rights, but it was, you know, it has been already been considered by Hollywood and already been considered by a lot of people. But, you know, if I could do it again, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't cut out, you know, the message and the purpose of the story in order to, to get a film made. Awesome. Well, as we wrap up, I don't want to take too much of your time. I know you have a very busy life and uh, I think we've, garnered a great portion of what the book is about but as as we wrap up tell everybody where they can find you if they want to get to you where they can purchase the book and also tell us if you have any future plans for upcoming stories okay so if you're interested in getting the book the best place to go is uh go to amazon.com you can get a paperback you can get a hardcover if you'd like to have something more durable or you can pick up ebooks uh, when the show airs on Wednesday, I'm going to have the ebook discounted down to 99 cents, so everybody that's listening can go snatch up a copy. If you're already a member of Kindle Unlimited, you can read the ebook from Amazon for free. If you don't have any of those things, you can get a copy at um, websites from Barnes and Noble. You can get them from Books a Million. You could go into your local bookstore and ask them, and they can order a copy and bring it over for you. Um, as far as future plans, I would love to write another book. I've got a four-year-old that I'm taking care of, and my wife is studying for her master's. So, you know, the the five years that I spent locked in my office writing, my wife was the one that was keeping me fed and keeping me in clean clothes. And <laughs> now, now she's doing her master's program. She has another year of that, and I am doing you know, returning the favor for her and making sure that she's got what she needs to do the studying that she's doing. So, you know, the next book is, I actually have a, a outline and a plan for another book, but, you know, I think that if I had known in the beginning how much work it was going to be, I might not have ever started. And, you know, now knowing what it is, it, it means I want to, I, I really don't want to give that much of my daughter's time away Mm-hmm. So it may it may be when she's you know may, not when she's grown and out of the house but when she's a little older you know. Well, we thank you very much for the interview, and we we definitely thank you for the book. I mean that it it was a pleasure to read as much as you could say a pleasure is about reading about child books. But uh, we wanted to you know for this national children's abuse awareness prevention month, we wanted to bring you on and have that conversation because we we think this is an important conversation. 
And with your permission, we'd like to, like to read a little excerpt of the book as we close the show out tonight. Wow, that would be fantastic. I appreciate oh, that. Awesome. So we're, we're going to jump into chapter 10 called Amen. And if anybody's listening to this, please make sure you go out and support this author as these are very important books that we bring to the community. And it, as you heard tonight, he's not in it for the money. He's not in it to get rich. He's in it to bring an awareness to the community. The hymn came to an end, and the congregation erupted in enthusiastic applause. The hymn came to an end, and the congregation erupted in enthusiastic applause. While they clapped, Pastor Alan Garnfield hurried to the stage. Taking a wireless microphone from the podium, he raised his 14-year-old son pianist hand and said, My son Joshua! Alan beamed with pride, and his equally talented friend Mike. Mike bowed over the body of his acoustic guitar. The crowd went on clapping while the young musicians returned to their seats. When the audience claim, acclaim tapered off, Alan approached the lectern. He opened his Bible and read aloud, Children, obey your parents in all things. The congrega- congregants fell silent, attending politely to his words. God's rule for children is complete, immediate obedience to every parental command. This applies to specific instructions like taking out the trash, as well as to standing orders like put the seat down when you're finished. Disobedience occurs any time a child does something that is forbidden or fails to do what is required. If you have to say it twice, that's disobedience. If the child hesitates or puts you off, That's disobedience. And if there is the slightest demonstration of displeasure in the child's eyes or posture as he obeys, then that must be dealt with disobedience as well. Alan's blue eyes hardened, making it clear that he said next was to be taken very seriously. A child who disobeys is in spiritual rebellion. He has placed himself on the equal level with his parent. This is witchcraft. The sin of Lucifer, who proclaimed, I will be like the Most High. He paused for dramatic effect. In the silence, the mother of the fidgety preschooler pulled her son's hand roughly away from his clip-on necktie. Ellen said, Joshua, please stand up. Joshua obeyed, standing at attention. Bring me a cup of water. Joshua hustled away. Ellen continued, When rebellion occurs, you must put it down decisively. The rebel must not the re, the rebel must be brought to justice and made to submit. He announced the number of a verse from Proverbs. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, he read, but the rod will drive it far from him. The rod Alan shouted, startling a few people, and infant began, began to cry. Not time out or bribes or grounding, not taking away privileges or extra chores. These are worldly methods, and they are powerless. They cannot drive foolishness away because they were not ordained by the Creator. They are futile. The young mother carried her fussy baby from the room. The Word of God is clear that only one thing can break rebellion and bring a child to submission. That, Alan Brooks spoke slowly, is the rod. He waited while parents wrote this in their notes. When their eyes returned to him, Alan adopted a more relaxed manner. The Bible gives one rule for children, that is obey. And it provides one consequence for disobedience. That is the rod. This is the Lord's method, and he has declared it worthy and effective for every situation. Amen! A male voice agreed from his left. Alan winced at the interruption, going on. He spoke as if he were merely repeating, for the record, something that everybody already knew. The rod is a neutral object. That means something other than your hands, he reminded them, should be reserved for caressing and nurturing. For babies below 12 months, use a one-foot rule or a willow switch. For older children, use the length of a flexible PVC pipe, a wooden dowel, or a belt. Fathers often prefer the belt, he declared aside, because it's in handy and convenient. 
Alan raised his voice to a passionate rumble. You must punish immediately upon the slightest disobedience. He slapped the podium. Consistency is the key. If you p- fail to punish even once, then the child will be forever tempted to try her luck. Never shout. Never give warnings or second chances. These things train your child to obey after you count to three or raise your voice. Instead, command them in the tones you use for conversation. If they do not instantly obey, give a whipping then and there. If you do this without fail, your home will always be quiet and peaceful. Josh placed a cup of water on the podium. Ellen acknowledged the service and directed Josh back to his seat. Before you give licks, the child must know why she's being punished. She must acknowledge her guilt by confessing her rebellion. Confessions should be spoken clearly and without whining or excuses. Otherwise, she's unrepentant. Give her stripes until her will is broken before offering another chance to confess. The one exception to this is for kids who are too small to talk. In that case, you can explain what she did and have her nod as if it is acceptable. Alan stopped to sip his water. He swallowed and then looked at his son. Thank you, Joshua. He put down the cup and then thundered, The rod is for the back of fools! The backs means everything except for the front. Generally, this would be the area between the lower and the back thighs, but feel free to spread your punishment around, especially if your kids require whippings that are frequent or prolonged. The goal is to make the child submit. To accomplish this, the punishment must be painful, and it must continue until the child's will is completely broken. You must utterly defeat him, Alan stressed. This as an important detail parents leaned in to write this information in their notes. Enduring in silence is a sign that you are too gentle to be effective. This is the this is almost always the case when parents claim that chastisement isn't working. Remember, the Bible doesn't say give love taps. It tells us blow that wound, cleanse away evil. Alan moved to a separate point. A repentant child submits to his punishment. If he shows defiance by screaming and jerking around, whip him even more. The Bible promises that stripes will not kill him. Alan smiled wirily. Even if he screams like he's dying. Audience members chuckled softly. Alan read another quote from the book of Proverbs. Chase it while there is hope and don't spare for his crying. Don't spare means don't let pity keep you from doing a thorough job. You must carry on until the child's will is totally surrendered. The sure indicator is when she stops struggling and her cries diminish to a submissive whimper. The pastor took a sip of water. When he was refreshed, he called a number of yet another verse from the book of Proverbs. The room sizzled with sounds of profusely churning pages. Along with the rod, there should be reproof. Reproof is verbal instruction related to the offense. The time to give it is when the child's will is broken. That way, her mind will be open as you restate the rule and back it with scripture. You must ask her questions. If her responses reveal a lingering bad attitude, whip her more sternly. Remember, punishment is not over until the child submits and accepts your verbal instructions. Finally, do not let your child cry for more than a minute. Crying beyond that point is intended to make you feel guilty. Ellen furrowed his bro, brow in disgust. The weeping child is punishing his parents for administering godly discipline. This is a serious rebellion. It means that the previous correction was completely ineffective. The blows weren't hard enough or you stopped before the child's will was surrendered. Either way, the response must be an even stronger dose of the same medicine. Win at all costs, he proclaimed before adding softly, for your child's sake. Of course, none of this should have be done in anger. Rather, you should act with love and calm determination. When discipline is complete, it's important you hug your child and assure them of your love. What happens next is amazing. 
Rebellion is transformed into gushing love. The child is happy and complacent. It is truly a miraculous thing. Alan closed his sermon with a light-hearted antidote. The tale ended with him saying, My three-year-old son looked me in the eyes and announced, I may be sitting on the outside, but inside, I'm still standing. If you'd like to read more about that book, or read the book, or have any interaction with M. Dolan Hickman, please make sure you check out all the links in the description. It is National Child Abuse Prevention Month. We brought this author on because we thought this was a very important topic and conversation to have. Please go support his work on Amazon and everything that he does. Thank you so much for sticking around for Cellar Door Skeptics. We have another amazing episode planned next week. We are going to do all sorts of stuff. We have another author on. Yes, we garnered another author. We're going to have another author on. And plus, we're going to have some science segments discussing black holes with Dan Bachelador. Find us on iTunes, Spreaker, Patreon, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, hell, even Instagram. And remember, prepare yourself for the revolution. Have a good night, everyone. You've been listening to a presentation of Cellar Door Skeptics. Check us out on Spreaker, CellarDoorSkeptics.com.